So thank you everybody for rejoining for session B. And if you're new to the forum this morning, welcome. We are, we are very honored to um, have a great uh, esteemed panel of judges and lawyers for this next session, which is devoted to a discussion of the, the role of the high anti-corruption court in Ukraine in countering strategic corruption. Uh, the, um, each of these panelists is an expert and a practitioner in countering systemic corruption by using the rule of law as, as, a, as a tool, uh, both in Ukraine and across the globe. But, you know, when the rule of law works, it's supposed to impose meaningful limitations on the state, on its high level uh, officials, on civil servants, on uh, private business, on transnational crime. And uh, as such, the, the rise of author authoritarian states fueled by corruption has turned the rule of law itself into a strategic battleground. And this is now widely known as, as lawfare. Fin following Ukraine's 2013 revolution of dignity, each of our panelists has stepped on to the lawfare battlefield. Each has sought to end the post-Soviet legacy of a weak, dependent, and captive judiciary and replace it with the institutional infrastructure that's required to support the rule of law, including independence and ethical judgments in investigations, prosecutions, and adjudications. So while the focus of our discussion today is, is the High Anti-Corruption Court, which was launched in September 2019 officially, uh, this is part of a, a multi-year effort to, in effect, reform the judiciary in Ukraine that has been uh, led and supported very ably by this group of panelists. So I'm gonna briefly introduce the panelists and then I'm gonna have a discussion with each of them uh, to, to uh, get their insights into the latest developments. We, today with us, we have Andrei Kozlov, who is a Ukrainian lawyer and legal scholar on judicial reform. Andrei has served as the commissioner of the High Qualification Commission of Judges of Ukraine from 2016 to 2019. He's also was an expert advisor on the Constitutional Commission, which was set up to discuss and draft uh, new constitutional amendments on human rights and, and the role of the judiciary. We are also joined by Mikhailo Zhernikov, who was a Ukrainian lawyer and former judge, and who is a co-founder of the, and uh, chairman of the board of the De Jure Foundation uh, which works uh, as a leading NGO in the judicial reform of Ukraine. Uh, Mikhailo was a former judge of the Venezia District Administrative Court and left that position in 2015 to join civil society as a leader and, um, and, and a promoter of uh, judicial independence. He serves as a member of the, and coordinator of the Public Integrity Council which has been established to vet the integrity of judges and candidates for, for new judgeships. We are also joined today by um, US federal judge, Mark Wolf, who is a senior judge in the US District Court of Massachusetts and uh, is widely known and respected for having tried several high stakes public corruption cases here in the United States, including perhaps most famously a case involving uh, and exposing the corrupt relationship between our own FBI and organized crime uh, informant known as Whitey Bulger. Um, in 2014, uh, Judge Wolf uh, authored a piece advocating for the creation of a new international anti-corruption court to combat grand corruption across the globe. And this, this court has since gained significant support from the uh, United Nations High Commission for Human Rights, from Transparency International, from Human Rights Watch, Global Witness, and other key international stakeholders. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start with a question for Andre. Um, Andre, following the revolution of dignity, you pushed for creating an independent judiciary and you focused in particular, particular on reforming the process for selection of judges. 
Why is the issue of judicial personnel so fundamental to Ukraine's goal to root out systemic corruption? You're, you're muted, Andre. You're, you're muted. Oh, really? There you go. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Messia, and thanks a lot for the invitation to this discussion, which I think would be very interesting. And um, so, let me tell you this. In uh, when building any state, you always have such things like institutions, procedures, and people. And in this triangle, or if you like spirometry better, a pyramid, people are always on top. People are those who create institutions, people are who are, who, are the, who are a part of the institutions, and people are those who follow the procedures or do not follow them. And they create the procedures, of course. And uh, with modern standards of independence, uh, with no proper accountability, well, judges become, I mean, corrupt judges become almost invincible because with all the independence guarantees, without proper accountability and without proper approach, without proper, I would say, inner self of those people, you would never get a proper quality of, of justice and of judiciary. And this is why uh, it was, well, uh, as a lawyer, as a practicing lawyer, I, I always had that feeling that sometimes we're speaking like different languages. And this was not only a generation gap, of course, because there was a great hope that uh, the generations would change and some other people will come and somehow magically everything will improve. This didn't happen. Uh, the problem is that uh, there is a strange combination now, uh, there is a strange combination of uh, old school judges who are more like oppressive kind and uh, those judges who are with a, let's say, more commercial mind, who felt that this, uh, this sort of profession, this sort of activity is not just uh, the call of duty, but also, uh, well, some profitable playground. This is yes. why I think that it's extremely, extremely important to put proper people into the judiciary. And of course, to assess their, their character, their, well, their aspirations, the true intentions, and so on, so on, so on. So as a high commissioner, as a commissioner to the High Qualification Commission, you were given the opportunity to set up the mechanisms for vetting the professionalism and ethics of judges. What, did, what mechanisms did you put in place? Well, um, once again, uh, let, let's put it this way. Of course, it was clear that uh, there should be a proper comprehensive vetting of all those people. And this, and, uh, and this was meaning that we had to look through all their, not, not accounts, of course, unfortunately they were defended by the bank and by the banking secret law. But uh, through their incomes and through their expenses and through their property, of course, and we had all, uh, all almost all the instrument in place to do this. Next, uh, we had to check various situations of conflict of interest when judges were sitting in the were presiding in the cases uh, where some of their close relations or some close circle was involved. And also what was, what was new and what, was, what is most interesting for the international community, we introduced the rule that 40% out of 100% of all the points would grant to the judge during the assessment, there is a 1,000 point scale. Uh, they go from uh, psychological tests, including IQ tests, general skills, including uh, in, including uh, uh, MMPI-2, Minnesota Multipersonal uh, Inventory, including, uh, high, uh, including integrity check, and including BFQ-2. 
all those instruments are well known to HR agencies as well. We are uh, an HR agency as well, so the government will. And um, well, oh, that, uh, Andre, was, Andre, Andre, that sounds. Go ahead. Well, this I would say this system is uh, a state of the art system, but what was introduced has never been being used properly. And I would say that the potential of this system was not was not used to its to its full extent. Yeah, you've indicated to me in our conversations that you think it's achieved around thirty percent of its potential to create independence in the selection of judges. What do you think is necessary to get from thirty percent to fifty percent of the potential here? Well. To use the to use these procedures to use the existing procedures properly, uh, well, not, not neglect them. Not ne never say this is just a psychological assessment because it's not just. It's about this person and about risk assessment and about the future of this person, which may well happen. This is the first thing. The other thing is uh, to give uh, more voice to the, uh, well, to the public council of integrity, a an auxiliary body consisting of uh, lawyers, journalists, and other people, or incorporate them into the high qualification commission. To, you know, because, uh, well, it's a kind of a corporate affair, I would say, because the judges, because all those judges in the commission they think in a way like, uh, well, it suits us, but they never think whether it suits a society in general. And uh, the voice of the society should be represented, of course. Uh, this is the second thing. And the third thing, I think uh, that, well, a proper role should be given to the uh, international experts either in Ukrainian procedures of uh, assessing or vetting judges or contest procedures, or at least they should have an active and decisive role in uh, choosing members of high qualification commission and probably high council of justice, which is the highest institutional body in Ukrainian judiciary. Andre, you also had a role in helping to choose the, the 38 new judges for the high anti-corruption court. How do you feel that process went? Do you feel it was more successful than other similar judicial selection processes? Well, I would say that uh, anti-corruption court judges selection made a difference and it was a real, it, it was a re really a pleasant procedure because this was our own procedure done right. Yeah. <laughs> For the first time it was done yes. right. Yes. And uh, the, the criteria that ha has always been around were, uh, were in place now. And uh, when we were speaking of integrity, we were speaking of integrity, uh, not about 1,000 of its iterations. And uh, well, uh, and all of this is because of international experts. Uh, the, the change was quite drastic because uh, uh, we had joint sessions, and there still must have been a majority of votes. But uh, there were six international experts from various countries, and including a former judge of the European Court of Human Rights, a former judge of the Lithuanian Supreme Court, and uh, well, uh, a, Br a British Court of Appeal for, uh, judge, and other people. So, uh, and three and. If three of them said no to some candidate, it was no. And this yeah. was the first time when uh, the doctrine, which has already been in the law, uh, the doctrine of reasonable doubt was introduced effective. And uh, well, of course, for such, a, for, such a for, such a, for such a position as a judicial position, in case of doubt, it is no. Yeah. And before, in case of doubt, it was yes or no <laughs> in various, in yeah. various portions. And, yeah. and uh, coming back to the importance of judicial person, 
per, per personal, you know, uh, I, I will give you one example from urban development. Uh, Pruitt Idol, if you remember this place. It was brilliantly engineered, but nobody thought of the social effect and of the people who were living there. And uh, well, very, very quickly, this place in St. Louis came to the state of, uh, well, ghetto and then slum. That's what happens to judiciary when with all the guarantees of independence, improper people get it. Yes. Thank you very much, Andre. It's very helpful. I'm going to turn now to Mikhailo. Mikhailo, you had a particularly uh, uh, strong role in pushing for the creation of the High Anti-Corruption Court. Can you tell us first why this court is and how it's different from other courts in Ukraine? Thank you. Very happy to be here, first of all. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Court. The idea was this, a similar idea to creation of the NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, uh, is to make prosecution of the high-ranking officials finally working. Because we understood we had a lot of, we didn't have much time, but we had to do something. And, and it requires enormous amount of time to reform the prosecution, the investigation, and the court system all at once. It will take years, and, and it's still taking years. So the idea was to create this kind of pockets of integrity, smaller institutions, but that would aim at, at, at the top officials, small by number, but very important by significance. So that would go after really top, top officials, presidents, ministers, and, and the like. Uh, and we created NABU, we as a country, uh, of course, our efforts were not the only ones. It was combined efforts of the many uh, civil society actors and, and people in the government and and the international uh, partners, and we succeeded. Um, so we first created NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, the investigatory body that went after these uh, corrupt individuals. And then we needed a court that would um, adequately consider the, their cases because the, the, the old judicial system was just dragging their feet at best or just uh, basically burying these, uh, um, these cases, these new, new investigations under huge amounts of, of old, basically sabotaging every effective investigation and, and um, court hearings in the, in the top corrupt, uh, corruption cases. So the idea was to create a separate court, but we already by the time knew that given the selection procedures to the old corrupt judiciary to get rid of the old corrupt judiciary kind of doesn't make sense. With all due respect to, to Andri here, we, well, we see him quite honestly as the only commissioner out of 16 who was honest always and who would always uh, fight for, uh, who would you know, question judges properly and who, who would always uh, try to find out, find out what, what, what are these, these judges are about. Because the rest, I'm, I'm sorry, but two thirds of the high qualification commission were judges and more than half were judges elected by the judges. And is just nonsense, not, just doesn't make sense to task the same judges or their representatives with weeding out the, the bad judges. It just doesn't make sense, uh, at least for the time being. It's a, it's a good, the judges elected by judges is a good standard where you want to preserve the system, when you want it to be self-governed, but you don't give self-governance to an organized crime. And I, which un, unfortunately in many, in many ways Ukraine's judiciary is. And uh, I shared a link here in the, in the chat uh, w w with examples how really, um, what is judiciary doing at the moment? So uh, we already by the time knew that this doesn't work. Uh, we, ha we have tried to create some other judicial institutions, including the, the new Supreme Court um, from scratch, but I, I will not dig into that. Uh, yes. It wasn't a very successful exercise because of the, yeah. because the, because the commission uh, and the High Council of Justice that uh, consisted mostly of the judges elected by judges at the time, they did not uh, do well. Uh, but, so the idea emerged to include the independent international experts. And also, yes, thank you, Andre, for mentioning the Public Integrity Council. We were there and we did give the commission our review and we found a lot of information about the lack of integrity of the candidates and the judges 
but they were in, in the vast majority of cases they were not taken into account and uh, because we did not have enough uh, we did not have any decisive power of our own it was all in the hands of the high qualification commission but so not but then that is why we said look the the only thing we can come up with now is also because corruption is a transnational problem let's include the independent international experts a panel of six people from uh, judges and prosecutors from respected countries delegated by respected institutions eu and such and uh, um, and give them a decisive role to weed out the bad apples the bad participants and surprise miracle happened uh with the with this with the formation of this court it turns out it is possible to create in ukraine the court in which not a single appointed judge has a very negative uh, um, reputation which was the case in the formation of the high anti-corruption court out of all 38 we had some yes we had to be very honest we had but there, there was there were honest misagreements between the, the the public and and the and turns out the 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 work about one or two judges and turns out the the court works quite well and now only today it delivered to two more good verdicts and and it goes and it works like a clock uh, so well, I, yeah, yeah. Michaela, I, so i take it then that you agree with andre that the selection process guided by the international advisors did indeed work and to go back to our sort of metaphor here on the strategic battleground that um that ukraine has become and in general and then in particular uh properly uh, uh, equipping the courts for independence. In effect, the high end corruption court is a beachhead. You've established a beachhead in the battlefield. Uh, give us your sense of how, how the court is working now that it's been in existence for almost 18 months. Right. Uh, well, to begin with, yeah, first of all, it's day and night, the selection of judges, right? The, the result of the selection, it, both the process and the result. It differs day and night from what was before because I do agree with Andre. Um, the the instruments that were uh, there were not used properly by the um, by the commissioners. Just to give you one example, the the candidate comes to before the commission and there's an interview and and they're asked uh, where do you get uh, the collection of watches, tens of do tens of thousands of dollars each. And there is also a court decision about this judge that they violated the automated case distribution system. And they, the, and they go through, they become a Supreme Court justice, and then they are selected the, the deputy head of the Supreme Court with obvious mismatch in, in property and all that. So that, that was all eliminated. That was not the case in the, in the um, uh, selection of the anti-corruption court. Um, this, this, the, the tiniest mismatch between what the judge says or, or what, what they do and their background uh, was not treated. Um, yeah, was was a was a ground for their basically their, their, their dismissal from the competition. But now, yes, the, the high anti-corruption court it works very well in our view. It, it's already I think it's thirty verdicts of the top ranking officials, judges, prosecutors, deputy ministers, ministers, and such. Uh, already, I think about a half of them, maybe a little less. It is confirmed by the appellate chamber of the High Anti-Corruption Court. So they came into force and people are going to jail for their misconduct. And they're, they're, they're again, they're top ranking officials. Th that is something that uh, Ukraine's justice system never seen before. And most, most probably, not most, but also one of the important things, it works fast. It delivers verdicts. And at the same time, um, even the defense attorneys say, the process is exemplary you know you you, you can get there and you can because uh, say the, the the opponents of the anti-corruption court said oh the, it was a specialized court to just confirm whatever nabu whatever the national anti-corruption bureau was bringing to them no um we, we're hearing that a lot from the um attorneys of the defense that they're saying the process is exemplary you can go you can bring evidence you can you can um you can you can exercise your rights and the rights of your uh, trustee, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, we think we think it's a 
it's, it's a very good example. This success story should be scaled to the rest of the judicial system. And that is something that we're trying to do now to include the independent international experts in rebooting the judicial governance bodies that will have to finally uh, reboot the rest of the judicial system. You know, thank you very much for that very uh, well balanced analysis and judgment as to where the, the high end corruption court has brought us. Uh, let me now turn to Judge Wolf. And, My pleasure. Uh, Judge Wolf, if you could start by just saying a couple words on how you think this effort in Ukraine to create uh, this new court has, has proceeded and progressed. We need you off mute, Judge. Yes, I will. And I, I thank uh, Alexander and you publicly, as I did privately, for organizing such an important, impressive, and rich uh, program. Uh, my perspective is basically as follows. In 2016, I met Yegor Sobolev, uh, a colleague and, and friend of my Ukrainian uh, co-panelist, uh, who was then the head of the anti-corruption committee of the Rada, the Parliament. And Yegor told me about his deep interest, widely shared in his community, uh, to see the creation of a high anti-corruption court. So I, uh, as chairman of Integrity Initiatives International, uh, had meetings with the World Bank, with the IMF, with key members of Congress uh, to essentially fortify their determination to see the creation of this court. Uh, there's been reference, well, when the then president, uh, Poroshenko, spoke to the Council of Foreign Relations, I asked him, why do you oppose the creation of this court? And he said, well, you don't have one in the United States. And if I had had the opportunity to respond, I would have said, you don't have a thoroughly, we don't have a thoroughly corrupt judiciary. But uh, it, it was coincidence. It wasn't cause about a month later because of the international pressure uh, in the need to get the funds from the IMF, from the World Bank and others, uh, he changed his position. The court was created. Then, as my colleagues have said, uh, there was this really important in innovation, uh, the Public Council of International Experts, who could, in effect, who would be able to, in effect, veto any uh, appointments or nominations. Uh, however, the international community was authorized to nominate up to 48 candidates for this uh, PICE, as I recall. And uh, in discussions with the Agor, informed by others, undoubtedly, he said it's very important that the minimum 12 be uh, recommended because they'll probably go and choose the weakest people they can. But if there are 12 formidable candidates, this will have the best chance of working. And uh, my colleagues and I advocated that. And again, I think it's more perhaps coincidence than cause. The international community recommended only that minimum of 12. Uh, I was in Kiev for the first time in November 2018 uh, as the, the members of this commission were being selected. And uh, I had the opportunity to speak to the High Qualification Commission, the High Council of Justice, Integrity Internet Initiatives International had originated the candidacy of three of the 12. And they discerned that and asked me about those three. It was very uh, revealing to me that none of those three was selected. I gave each of them strong endorsements and they weren't picked. Uh, but they did, as we've heard, uh, get a superb, uh, dedicated uh, group of international uh, uh, experts. And since the creation of the hack, I've had a series of, of meetings in, in person with the judges. And uh, last month, uh, virtually in a program that George Kent also participated in, uh, to mentor them to work with ECHA and the European Union Anti-Corruption Initiative uh, and USAID funded New Justice Program to uh, provide uh, support for these uh, judges. And in fact, uh, we're now resuming what will be a successful effort to create an international panel of distinguished judges to both advise the hack judges who are generally 
young and relatively inexperienced, which is what was necessary to get honest judges, and also to advocate for them uh, when uh, they're in battle, as they are already. Judge, that is a terrific um, story, and, and it's very, um, I think, helpful to understand how judges can, can, in effect, form a network internationally and elevate these issues at international institutions like the World Bank and IMF as part of this overall process. Let's use the remaining five minutes of your time to discuss your, your initiative to create an international version of this high end corruption court and how these two initiatives can work together and how they're complementary. Wonderful. So uh, as I said, I chair Integrity Initiatives International. The mission of III is to strengthen the enforcement of criminal laws against corrupt leaders. We do that in a variety of ways, including supporting national efforts exemplified by the hack and by uh, catalyzing a campaign for an international anti-corruption court to fill a crucial uh, gap in the international structure. Uh, as all of us know, grand corruption, the abuse of public office for private gain by a nation's leader has, uh, is pervasive in many countries and uh, historically, including Ukraine. It has devastating consequences. Uh, uh, kleptocracy is not a domestic uh, uh, issue. As uh, Michaelo uh, said, uh, it's a global problem. Uh, the funds that uh, kleptocrats uh, receive, often from oligarchs, uh, don't stay in their own countries. Uh, they corrupt the uh, the international financial system that they exploit in indignation at grand corruption is destabilizing many countries and creating grave threats to international peace and security, again, exemplified by Ukraine. Grand corruption doesn't thrive because of a lack of laws. 187 countries are parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption. They all have laws uh, prohibiting extortion and bribery, money laundering, misappropriation of national resources. But those laws aren't uh, enforced against the nation's leaders uh, when the rulers are corrupt themselves. They control the police, the prosecutors, and the uh, courts. And therefore, an international anti-corruption court is needed uh, to provide a forum to prosecute those kleptocrats, their enablers, their collaborators. Uh, the court, as we conceive it, would enforce existing uh, anti-corruption laws enacted pursuant to the UN Convention or a uniform car counterpart. It would be a court of last resort. It would operate on the principle of complementarity. And that means it would only prosecute high officials from countries that are unwilling or unable to prosecute themselves. Russia would be a paradigm of a country unwilling. Uh, but to some extent, Ukraine, uh, although it's made remarkable progress, uh, is one that may be unable to prosecute its highest officials themselves or itself, even in the hack. And uh, this would, uh, this court would provide a place where kleptocrats, high officials, proven in fair proceedings to be uh, guilty, could be imprisoned, creating the opportunity for the democratic process to replace them with honest leaders. It would deter others, and it would be a means of uh, recovering and repatriating uh, stolen assets. Uh, there is a substantial coalition of international leaders, NGOs, uh, that's emerged, as you said, Matthew, to support this court. And indeed, uh, next week, uh, signatories to a declaration of support of the court uh, will be collected and soon announced. This international anti-corruption court has substantial support in Ukraine, including from the leaders of NABU, SAPO, the Special Prosecutor's Office, and the hack judges themselves. This principle of complementarity creates an incentive for countries to strengthen the, their own domestic capacity to prosecute high-level corruption so their leaders won't be subject to prosecution in the international anti-corruption court. 
The International Anti-Corruption Court, as we conceive it, would also be a resource where expert uh, investigators, prosecutors, and judges could advise hack judges, for example. And the IACC would be a place where cases that are too formidable for NABU and SAPO and the high anti-corruption court at this time and their development to prosecute themselves uh, to be prosecuted. Um, you imagine. Judge, I, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, 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 no, please go ahead. One please. more minute and I'll, I'll finish. I'm sorry. Uh, please, yeah. But, no, that's uh, all right. That's all right. No, but, uh, you know, you have problems in Ukraine. You, you have a, a judge, uh, I'm sorry to say, in Ukrainian, his name is Wolf, uh, who, who uh, has been resisting su subpoenas uh, to go to the high anti-corruption court. Well, maybe they would prefer to go to the high anti-corruption court rather than the international anti-corruption court. Uh, but until these Ukraine institutions become sufficiently strong uh, to say, handle a case, if you developed evidence, that Mr. Furtash uh, bribed uh, Mr. Yanukovych, uh, that would be prosecuted in the International Anti-Corruption Court. And one of the reasons uh, many Ukrainians in the special uh, institutions support the International Anti-Corruption Court is it would depoliticize the process. Routinely, when high officials are prosecuted, it's claimed this is a partisan prosecution. Usually they're former officials. This would be an impartial, neutral forum, and it would also be a place where whistleblowers like Daria and others uh, could bring evidence. Uh, if it wasn't going to be used, if it couldn't effectively be used in their own countries, it could be used in the International Anti-Corruption Court. Thank you. So, Judge, that is really very helpful and illuminating, and I, I would stress to, to, to the participants in the audience today that this subject of complementarity the ways in which this international court could be used to depoliticize prosecutions and adjudication is a very important subject to explore and could be done in, a, in a, another event um, and definitely merits another event that would um, go into this subject very deeply. Let me close by saying congratulations to each of you. It's important to recognize how much progress that you have made today in establishing, uh, let's say, new uh, new standards and, and for adjudication and, in effect, uh, a new coalition and constituency for the rule of law, both locally and internationally. Thank you very much for, for your comments today. Alex, uh, over to you and um, uh, good, luck with, good luck with your work, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Now, now we meet. We move to the question of pragmatic EU and U.S.-led engagement with everything that we have talked about, and it's just an absolute uh, privilege to introduce our next speaker, uh, Eka uh, Tekalashvili. <laughs> and my Georgian pronunciation is always awful, uh, but she is the head of the program of the European Anti-Corruption Initiative, um, and that is specifically the program tasked to improve the implementation of anti-corruption policy in Ukraine. Uh, she is also the president of the Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, I would say the country's most influential and famous think tank. And she has served uh, before, I won't go through them all, in numerous positions in the Georgian government, including deputy prime minister, minister of foreign affairs, secretary of the National Security Council, as well as the minister of justice. She has made engagement with governance issues on both the democracy and the anti-corruption front really a focus of her career. And she is, I would say, a really effective interlocutor, um, helping to explain um, to various communities how things operated and what things uh, need to be done. I think the, the title of the segment is a holistic strategy for countering a systemic challenge. And so I think uh, Eka can provide us her perspective on how do you put all these moving parts together in a meaningful uh, um, a strategy. Uh, how do they fit together? Uh, how do you achieve sort of oversight? How do you prod for the necessary reforms and what timing and what sequence? Eka, thanks again uh, for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to your insights and experience. 
Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me here. It's been a terrific discussion to be part of and, and then listen to all of the participants. And I hope that I, I won't disappoint the listeners and the participants now with, with my, uh, my intervention. Um, title itself is quite demanding, as you have said, uh, to describe and identify characteristics of what, what makes any strategy holistic and then why it matters to have a holistic strategy when you tackle uh, uh, complex challenges it is, uh, corruption per se, and systemic corruption even more so, right? And then in that regard, uh, to understand that it's not just the buzzwords that we all use at many times, holistic, comprehensive, sustainable, but rather what is an actual essence into it when we speak that if we tackle corruption as a systemic uh, problem in any given country, that the approach and strategy for that matter indeed needs to be holistic. And what are the elements and characteristics that makes any strategy then holistic in that regard? And I think in that regard, part of what we need to be always mindful while describing that is that systemic corruption, what makes it different from, from a problem of corruption that any country uh, globally faces, that corruption is not a derogation from a rule when you face a systemic corruption. It is systemic in terms of being not only large scale, but then it is, it is settled and schemed out in any field of the governance and in the relationship of the governance and businesses and public and society. And in that sense, I don't like myself the world endemic. It just presupposes that it never ends as if we have to live with it forever and ever, but rather to use the word systemic because you can tackle systemic corruption if you are systemic enough uh, in terms of fighting corruption at that level. And then in that, in that way, if we look into the systemic corruption, we have to understand obviously that it rests on certain pillars which, which sustain it at a systemic level and they are intertwined. So the distinction between prevention and prosecution in corruption, which is frequently talked about theme as well. And I agree that it's important to have character, characteristics in mind of, of both directions when we design the strategy and then implementation uh, strategies and plans for that matter, but they are so much intertwined that at many times it's difficult even to separate them at much because what is, uh, what is frequently thought to be a prosecution part of fight against corruption has an important deterrence element into it which serves a preventative uh, function as well. And what uh, classically could be thought as a preventative measure, for example, e-declaration system that uh, Ukraine has, has quite a bit of accountability and fight against impunity element into it as well. But before going into direction a bit more, and I've been asked to provide more information about e-declaration system, which is a very important case study to tackle uh, in my intervention, I would say, uh, just to set this scene with one more important, I guess, strategic element for our discussion, that any strategy uh, to tackle systemic corruption, in my understanding, has these two important elements into it, disruptive element and creative element. And disruptive element is frequently overlooked. And the, the main effort and focus goes into the creative part of it. What are the institutions that we are creating? What are the new laws that we are introducing? How we are strengthening the capacity of institutions that have to play a role in the process. But before they all start to be functional, and then before we reach the strategic outcome that is targeted at a larger scale, and then specifically with these institutions, we are disrupting what is already at place. Uh, which is a uh, corrupt schemes and systems. And this process is never easy. It's always painful. And it always strikes back when it comes to the vested interest striking back uh, from different angles with different capacities they still have at hand. And uh, the, the lesson learned in that regard for all of us in different countries with different experiences, certainly it's the case in Ukraine as well, is that to be ready for that not to overlook that factor and to understand that it's not a linear process of assisting uh, developments in the creative dimension of creating the institutions, laws, et cetera, et cetera, but then be ready to sustain achievements when they do because they are disrupting corruption schemes at place. And then with all the force that the vested interests have, they are coming back at them. And we need to be ready to sustain step-by-step -step achievements that I achieved so that that becomes a next ground and platform for, 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 for further developments and then for sustainable results at the end of the day. And in that regard, I would say that uh, the, the um, 
all, all the lessons learned, so to say, that I have now with few years of experience already uh, in Ukraine and then quite a bit in my own country is that uh, it is clarity of the vision that is uh, important from the very beginning. What is an outcome that we are targeting? I liked the word, Alex, you used laser precision that is needed as well for disruption purposes, especially so that we know where is, is best to strike first to maximize effect for more cracks into the corrupt schemes which opens the space and opportunities for more creating uh, instruments to come up and then take up uh, the, the place of what used to be corrupt uh, practices and behavioral patterns with the new, more creative, and then uh, systems and institutions that serve the public, as the prosoro is, for example, that has been described previously. And in that regard, I would say that I've been fortunate enough uh, to, to join the program which has been very wisely devised by the EU with having that holistic approach into it already embedded so that we would target not only the institutional development of all anti-corruption bodies that have emerged in Ukraine, but then at the same time, help to do that with central at the level of the central authorities, at the level of the local authorities as well, and then to help bringing capacity to the civil society as well, for them to have a better capacities of serving the purpose that was needed uh, at that level as well. So in declaration system now, and then as, an, as a case study to look at perhaps having in mind to what we already have talked about, the disruptive element, creative element, and how much it, it, it takes to be ready for that uphill battle because, before we can say that it's already irreversible in terms of an outcome that has been achieved in that sense. Uh, for, for those who don't, are not aware of the e-declaration system in Ukraine, now it's, it's a massive system of more than a million e-declarations every year submitted by all public officials, high uh, and then middle, ground, middle level, and then they, uh, every, basically every civil servant in that case, everybody who gets paid by the taxpayers' money is uh, obliged to submit uh, quite detailed uh, declaration of their assets and properties uh, and their family members as well, obviously included into that. But the evolution of that system is, is indeed a very interesting case study on all, in all these dimensions that we have talked about. Now, if we approach it from the perspective of um, accountability, how one tackles impunity and how one uh, and it reintroduces accountability for corruption, including through large scale uh, exposure of uh, corrupt and uh, illicit assets uh, that uh, are accumulated by the public officials through that level of transparency. It started in, uh, in, after the revolution of dignity in Ukraine with the two laws that have been introduced at the time in October 2014 with the illustration law and then with the law on corruption prevention. And then why illustration law? Because before NACP, which is the agency for the prevention of uh, uh, corruption in Ukraine, custodian of the whole system of e-declaration as well, was actually created. A obligation to submit declarations already emerged for public officials, but with limited sort of scope at the time in terms of this depth of details and then how declarations were submitted at a time starting from 2015. It was PDF formats, not electronic machine readable formats of declarations that had to be put on the websites of the public institutions, but it was the beginning. But what came later was an electronic system of e-declarations that had to be submitted by all public officials. It uh, had to be then managed and administered by the specially created agency as part of the new anti-corruption framework in Ukraine, National Agency for the Corruption Prevention. And then uh, it had to be fully digitalized easily accessible and then easily accessible for analytical purposes as well for civil society for law enforcement and not only for uh, for verification of the correctness of the information by the NACP itself so the exposure of this vast information that came in with the e-declaration system had this purpose of transparency exposure change of mindset from within the public institutions for the public service uh, representatives that everything is known now uh, to the public that you own and that, that element of deterrence that it brings into it. But at the same time, it served the purpose of accountability as well. Not that well in the beginning within NACP itself, 
but by law enforcement agencies, specialized ones like NABU and SAPO, the way information and e-declarations was picked up by them, by civil society organizations that are extremely creative in Ukraine uh, to, to analyze and expose, inf expose information that came out from the e-declaration system. And then uh, in, in that regard, it changed uh, behavioral pattern from the point of view of expectation of public that it's not a rumor based information they might have that all public employees are corrupt and they are rich but rather having something as a point of departure actual information that they could uh, take as a reference point in, in that regard uh, but that process uh, of, of how much had to be done for that to reach that effect was by all means no linear, because what we've seen from the very beginning was that uh, a very effective start, because international community did something that is uh, more rare rather than um, given in those situations, that even before NACP as an agency was created in the fall of 2016 and started to be operational, uh, under the international funding, UNDP already developed the registry, electronic registry that could be used and then be readily available by that time, including module for verification of e-declarations. And it's an interesting element that I wanted to point out that when the opportunities are emerging for something new to be created, it's important to seize this momentum without wasting time. And it was a very wise decision to invest into this registry even before NACP was put at place as an agency so that there would have been no time wasted for the creation of this registry after the agency would have been already operational at that time. At least at that time, the calculated risk was taken that it was better to invest into it rather than wait until the agency would have been fully put at place. And indeed it was a risk because the process of acceptance of the registry by NACP was not simple at that time. And then the other agency for the security of the state communications intervened. So it took some time before it became fully operational. Uh, NACP never accepted, for example, automated module for verification. Uh, which is then special algorithms basically that check the verification uh, e-declarations for uh, red flagging uh, uh, risky uh, cases uh, in that case uh, for full verification. But I still believe that it was a very wise decision for that to be done ahead of the time because at at least the boost and bolstering of the process have taken and that in, in, uh, quite, quite significantly at that time. What ensured for this system to be at the time fully operational with all the digitalization works being put at place when the troubleshooting had to be done with non-performance of NACP. And I'll explain a bit later if there will be time for that, what happened with institutional development of NACP at the time was a very strong coordinated and consolidated action of international community, including leadership of the EU in this case, which took it up at the level of microfinancial conditionalities with the Ukraine of ensuring that the system would function properly. And then it was not downgraded to the level of some logistics, but rather was taken as up as a strategic level issue vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian counterparts at that time. But then having uh, said that, uh, we have to be mindful, as I've mentioned it initially as well, that overall legal framework uh, is an important uh, terrain in which any system operates. And then when I said that Western interests strike back, they strike back in different directions. And one direction that we've experienced in Ukraine that they strike back is how it is attempted to change or roll back the innovative uh, achievements in legislation and, and then uh, in e-declaration systems suffered from that as well, including what Daria mentioned in the beginning through the decisions of the Constitutional Court as well. When almost all of the developments in the e-declaration system developments uh, started to be uh, rolled back, especially vis-a-vis -vis judges quite clearly at the time, and, and then uh, by abolishing a very important element of accountability linked to declarations, criminal responsibility for intentionally submitting false declarations or non-submitting declarations. And that was scrapped out by the Constitutional Court's decision at the time. And then a lot of effort had to be put at place by local actors, by political actors, civil society, international partners, so that we had a gradual comeback to where we were before the Constitutional Court's decision at the time. But 
some negative effect of it is already state because uh, cases that were uh, in internet in high end corruption court already processed based on false declarations and intentional non submittal of the declarations had to be closed at the time because of the decision of the constitutional court at the time. So when we speak about uh, challenges and troubleshootings that had to be done at different times. Uh, it became very apparent that in Ukrainian context that vigilance of uh, maintaining uh, legislative framework and legal certainty remains to be one of the key challenges until the time when judiciary is fully reformed, including constitutional court, I would say, and then until there is a legislative process in the parliament that is more conducive to, uh, to certainty to the law and legal framework that could be brought to that. Because as you can imagine, all the members of the parliament, they have to fill the declaration so that even from logistical point of view, nobody maybe likes it still until now. And very final comment, if I still have time for that, on institutional premise itself, why it matters to bring up the institutions and then uh, incapacitate them with the capacities that they need. And I would say in this regard that I will add one element uh, from international community as well, we need to be ready to accept at times that troubleshooting is needed because we might have made some mistake collectively with others as well, because some approach that was deemed to be good didn't play well. It's important to acknowledge it as early as possible to that amend the course of development. And again, NACP is a good, good case in point, I would say. Irrespective of international communities' role in it, it became clear that NACP as an institution, which was a collegial body, comprised at the decision-making level with five commissioners nominally, but then in effect there were always four most of the time rather than five, uh, didn't prove to be a capable mechanism for an institution that had to be robust in its action. For the primarily for the reasons that selection process of these commissioners as well was flawed. Yes, it was uh, comprising civil society representatives in it as well. It was under the government's umbrella, but the whole procedure was not pre precise enough. Integrity check of the members, uh, applicants was not uh, as robust as it was for the high anti-corruption court, for example, or in the, for the reboot of NACP's head uh, that has taken its uh, place lately. So we ended up with the institution, which had a collegial body on top, uh, which had different influence points from different political actors at different times. Uh, some good members left the organization early on and then and then organization that showed no determination to act on its very important mandate for the prevention of corruption. So collective thinking was timely enough to understand that I would say in Ukraine and see that reboot of this organization was needed. And ultimately the result of that was uh, the adoption of the amendments to the law, which changed the management structure of NACP, but not only that, elements and that happened in the fall of 2019 that had the new element of the selection of the new hat with the participation of international experts into it. The same experience that was put forward for the selection of judges of high anti-corruption court was well applied in this selection process as well. And there were a couple of two very important elements into it, except for the selection process, auditing procedures for the new, um, uh, for, for the rebooted NACP, so to say as well. And with that, what we are seeing now is day and night in terms of change of the action of NACP, uh, the collaboration with other uh, anti-corruption agencies, the determination to act and different fronts of their mandates that are well beyond of the e-declaration system per se, and their collaboration with civil society as well. So I would say that uh, that case study of how it evolved from where and then at which point of development it is now, uh, is, is an example that uh, the process is not yet finished. NACP now is becoming yeah. to be targeted. And then, as I've mentioned, so we need to be resolute as well to see through this process in a way that ultimately it delivers a strategic outcome of accountability and, uh, and then tackling of impunity uh, as, as, as Ukrainian public deserves for that to have in terms of trust that needs to be rebuilt between government and then the public at the end of the day. Well, Sorry, I guess I rushed through oh, my no, issues no. at you're, some point. Because we have one more segment to get through, but thank you not only for the, 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 the view on you know, what systemic means to you, but I think what you brought in is especially this temporal dimension. When are the windows of opportunity? What needs to be done when? Um, and then how do you build in 
sort of mechanisms for reassessment and renegotiation, and also convince donors and funders that framework maintenance is just as important as scoring a high level win by setting something up. I see this in foundations all the time. It's just not rewarded the system maintenance and yet it's so important to prevent decay. So Eka, thank you again. Uh, Matthew, I'll move to you for our final segment. Thank you very much, Eka, and thank you, Alex, indeed. And it's very fitting that uh, for our final speaker, we are honored to have Mark Ellingstead from USAID in Ukraine. Uh, Mark is the head of the Office of uh, Democracy, Rights, and Governance at USAID Ukraine, where he works with 20 Ukrainian and American professionals on anti-corruption, decentralization, judicial reform, political processes, civil society. Coincidentally, Mark has also represented USAID at the European Union, and in that capacity uh, was working on the way our programming uh, from the United States connects with the EU and in, in countries such as uh, Ukraine and other uh, countries in the region. I should also mention that Mark's office, the Office of Democracy, Rights and Governance, is part of an international hub at USAID, which is headquartered in Washington, but has like 90 offices across the globe, where the goal is to share learning and know-how and data and build better programming uh, from experiences in Ukraine, for example, uh, in a way that can help programming in other parts of the world. So DRG, as it's called, is effectively a learning organization that partners with academic institutions. So we're especially glad to have you here today, Mark. Um, Mark uh, would very much welcome your thoughts on, on first what you've kind of taken away from this morning's discussion and, and what you are envisioning and modeling for the future of USAID programming in this space. Thanks very much, Matthew. And thank you, Alexander, uh, for, for hosting this this uh, really great session. So I'm gonna start by just uh, uh, giving a little bit of our perspective on how we see the challenge and then uh, walk through the, the range of tools we have uh, to, to address the challenges. Uh, when we do polling, corruption consistently comes up as the number one problem for Ukraine's citizens. 88% say corruption is important or very important. A strong majority of the public, 87%, believes that the government has not been effective at fighting corruption. Although perceived corruption and personal experiences with corrupt practices have declined since the revolution of dignity in 2014, perceptions of grand political and oligarchic corruption remain very high. And we all know that corruption holds back development in Ukraine, it hinders domestic and foreign investment, steals from the pockets of taxpayers and consumers. It also undermines Ukrainians' faith in governance and in the country's democratic institutions. Corruption also presents a fundamental geopolitical challenge to the Ukrainian state and its citizens. Corrupt schemes and money laundering have been important tools of the Kremlin in trying to influence the direction that Ukraine takes. High levels of corruption hinder further integration into European markets and systems. It also helps the Kremlin normalize concepts of corrupt autocratic rule across borders. In the past year, we've tracked an increasing openness, including by certain judges and even some in the parliamentary, parliamentary majority to be critical of and hostile towards US and EU reforms under the guise of criticizing external management. This takes place as they see transparency and anti-corruption reforms threaten their personal interests. Ironically, many who use the terminology of external management are affiliated with pro-Kremlin entities. If anyone is trying to manage Ukraine from abroad, it's Russia. So what is USAID doing on this as a development agency? As Eka was, was explaining, we also see uh, corruption as a primary uh, development challenge. And we formed an integrated strategy across our entire $160 million a year portfolio to address it. We think it's important not to ghettoize anti-corruption efforts or to see 
the factors at play too narrowly or simplistically. Across the gamut, we work closely with government, with the RADA, with civil society and media. And I'm gonna touch first on our work supporting government reform efforts, and then I'll come back to our work uh, to support civil society and independent media, which play such important roles. Of course, political will dynamics are obviously key in deciding which way we go. Ukraine's two runaway successes in recent years provide key opportunities for us and other donors to prevent corruption from even occurring while simultaneously improving the efficiency and transparency of public services. First, digit digitalization and e-governance. Ukraine has made huge gains and it is in many ways a true leader on this front. We're proud to have supported key e-governance efforts at the central level. To date, through support to the Ministry of Digital Transformation, we've helped the government digitize 31 key public services, including business registration, application for unemployment benefits, and construction permit applications. USAID is proud to support ProZoro, the program we heard about earlier today, which has proven a huge success and in many ways was a vanguard for Ukraine's e-governance transformation. Second, decentralization. Ukraine has made huge strides in moving substantial decision-making and resource allocation down to the local level. About 34% of public resources are, are decided at the public level. And there's strong levels of support across the political spectrum for this. Local governments are now able to be laboratories of practical reform with predictable revenue flows and increasing operational flexibility. USAID supports local governments to utilize process engineering IT and IT solutions to make citizen services across the spectrum more transparent and efficient. Last September, I was in Mariupol in Ukraine's east, and it, I was so impressed to see the modern, efficient way that the municipality provided services. The dedication with the, 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 I saw from the municipal employees was, was just remarkable. This is world-class service provision that would make citizens in Sweden, the US, or Germany proud, but it's now the everyday normal in Mariupol and other cities across Ukraine. Digital solutions demonstrate that anti-corruption efforts don't always need to be adversarial. There is overwhelming support in government for such reforms, which are generally seen as modernizing and benign. These are everyday solutions that impact ordinary citizens, making their lives easier and reducing petty corruption. This demonstrates the importance of making in incremental improvements in key areas where citizens come in contact with government. Now turning to our support for anti-corruption institutions, we're providing assistance to the Na National Agency for the Prevention of Corruption in line with the government's anti-corruption strategy, fostering a whole of government approach to, to Ukraine. We're enhancing government anti-corruption strategic communication capabilities, strengthening the ability of these bodies to speak with one united voice to all stakeholders, including the public. We're also helping to strengthen the high anti-corruption court and improve operational capacity, including helping the, nas the nascent court draft and implement internal policies, building and the capacity of court staff, providing targeted training on complex issues such as case management and helping strengthen its legislative framework. Turning to other sectors um, in the economic sphere, we work in energy, agriculture, finance, with the goal of uh, helping enterprises, especially small and medium enterprises, grow and develop and become more transparent. We, we do partner with the government to tackle reform of state-owned enterprises, which fuel corruption and efficiency across all sectors. Now, uh, Judge Wolf talked about justice sector reform earlier and, uh, and as an ECA, and I think we would all agree that's probably where, um, where it's the most critical. Justice sector reforms are closely linked with anti-corruption success. There is a clear problem in Ukraine of judges being selected on the basis of affiliation with vested interests or political parties. There have been outrageous examples of judges ignoring their own conflicts of interest and the law in making decisions clearly designed to benefit themselves and their benefactors. Two weeks ago, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, or NAVU, publicized a photo showing a large table stacked high with dollars, euros, hryvnia, and shekels 
amounting to $5 million in value linked to one particularly notorious judge in Kyiv. The said same judge has managed to avoid numerous attempts by Nabu to serve him with summons to respond to solid allegations of graft. This is the judge that uh, uh, Judge Wolf was also talking about. Without progress on judicial integrity, the Ukrainian public and investors alike will continue to harbor doubts in Ukraine's ability to fairly administer justice. The best anti-corruption laws and bodies in the world don't help if parts of the judiciary are themselves corrupt. Advancing holistic judicial reform is essential to restoring public trust in government and an important signal to domestic and international stakeholders regarding Ukraine's commitment to democratic development and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. We're working very closely with civil society. And of course, other donors such as the, the IMF and, and the EU and World Bank on these issues. And I do have to say that the international cohesion on these issues in Ukraine has been remarkable. It's, it's been very, very good and it's really needed because the issues here are so tough. We all recognize the importance for cleaner, more transparent judicial selection processes to take oligarchs out of the equation. The, the challenges in the justice sector illustrate the importance of the work that civil society and independent media do. Thanks to their efforts, the public has much greater access to information than just a few years ago. Without their hard work and bravery, which is sometimes repaid with violence and arson, Ukrainian citizens would not have found out the details of corruption and conflict of interest cases in the Constitutional Court, the Kyiv District Court, Administrative Court, and the Office of the President. On the one hand, it's discouraging to see such grave corruption still occurring in Ukraine seven years after so many died so that Ukraine would have a better, brighter future. On the other hand, because of the brave hard work of civil society and investigative journalists, there is much greater awareness and accountability now than there was just a few years ago. Our work with journalists, transparency advocates, and groups of concerned citizens is critical for driving reforms forward. USAID provides support for these watchdogs and advocates to ensure more transparency and efficiency in the spending of public funds to empower citizens and to advance critical anti-corruption reform implementation. In the media sector, we, we support independent journalism as another check on corrupt practices. We assist in strengthening the media's analytical capacity to report on key sector reform issues such as health, agriculture, and infrastructure. We also support investigative journalism efforts, which are so critical in unpeeling the increasingly complex layers of money laundering and corruption schemes. In conclusion, the pernicious influence of oligarchs in the Ukrainian political economy represent a festering complex set of challenges to the country's progress and to integration into Euro-Atlantic institutions. Today, we do have a greater understanding of the, of the nature of the threat and the fact that it presents a danger beyond Ukraine's borders. The US has taken concrete actions recently against a number of the oligarchs, ranging from travel bans to sanctions. In the newly reinvigorated bilateral relationship with Ukraine, there has been a much more open discussion of these issues. The US has been unequivocal, unequivocal on the need for greater progress on this front in Ukraine. The government of Ukraine has taken a number of promising measures that begin to address challenges of corrupt money from Russia controlling key media to wage information warfare on, U on Ukraine. And we are starting to see encouraging signs of willingness at the top to call out and directly address oligarchic control and manip manipulation. Parts of the government are also publicly speaking about the need to reform Ukraine's judicial system and come to an agreement on an IMF standby arrangement, which includes key justice reform benchmarks. So let me just close with a few thoughts. The anti-corruption institutions are now formed and operational. They are delivering results. However, according to our polling, these results are unfortunately not yet registering with the public nor translating into perceived progress made in the fight. Ukraine is not yet frying the big fish and struggles to make dents on grand corruption and translate successes into tangible benefits that ordinary citizens feel. Fortunately, despite this, public commitment to anti-corruption still remains very strong. However, if, the, if perception of the government's inability to address corruption continues, we cannot 
expect public commitment to stay high forever. If commitment levels stop dropping, Ukraine is in trouble. A public disillusioned and fatigued with the fight against corruption will spell consequences for the sustainability of the anti-corruption agenda. Not to mention Ukrainian, Ukraine's international partners don't have unlimited patience nor bottomless pockets to support such efforts infinitely. For now, Ukraine does have the public support. The anti-corruption infrastructure is in place and operational, and it has a strong support of international development partners and uh, as Eka uh, referenced before. So now is the time to accelerate progress on anti-corruption reforms, tackling both elite and petty corruption, and ensuring and communicating tangible benefits of the fight against corruption to the public. We at USAID stand committed to supporting our Ukrainian partners in defeating corruption, strengthening democratic institutions, and delivering greater economic prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I want to um, quickly highlight a couple of key points that you brought to the surface uh, at the end of our sessions today. One is the importance of the trust of Ukraine citizens in progress towards anti-corruption reform. And the, that means two things. It means establishing independent institutions in fact, and it means creating independent institutions that are perceived to be independent. And those are two different challenges. And sometimes success in one sphere actually creates risks and problems in the other sphere in the sense that the public begins to see how big the corruption problem is as progress is made. Uh, also, thank you for highlighting how USAID takes a cross-sectoral approach to addressing this issue and is, is um, prioritizing it really across the entire portfolio in, in Ukraine, which is of course welcome. I will just mention quickly that coincidentally, I noticed that USAID has recently issued a request for information uh, which is your way of going out to the public, including the people in the audience in this call, in this, uh, in this forum, for ideas about how to improve and incorporate lessons learned and fighting corruption going forward in Ukraine. So um, that's out there now, and, and people are welcome, I think, to, to provide feedback there, correct? Absolutely. That makes our design stronger. Great. So, um, uh, Mark, again, thank you. And, and we're at the conclusion of this. I'm just going to very quickly say a couple of words and then turn the floor back to Alex. Um, there, this, this audience, this group of experts needs no reminders of how important this issue is and, um, you know, that, that the internal threat uh, that corruption poses to Ukraine's sovereignty is indeed real. But perhaps we all needed a, a bit of a reminder of how much progress we've made. And I think that's, uh, that purpose has been well served today by this tremendous group of experts across disciplines, across levels of experience. And I think it bears mentioning simply that it does take a network to defeat networks. And um, one of the most important resources that Ukraine has is its human capital. It's the, the, the leadership, the creativity, the, the will, the determination of its citizens to stand up and, and be counted as, as sovereign individuals. And that's where this, um, that's where this uh, effort uh, is, is, I think, succeeded. And that's very well evidenced today. And, and also, it, you know, the Harriman Institute and this forum both serve as, as resources for you in that uh, respect. There, there are ways that we hope we can help uh, going forward uh, to generate solutions based on um, the commitment and dedication and knowledge and expertise that you've accumulated. So uh, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you to the audience and over to you, Alex.
Yeah, just thank you on behalf of Harriman for this wonderful discussion. You're all so busy. You're all so insightful. This has been terrific. Let's keep the forum going. A special plea to my graduate students, as well as researchers out there. There is so much interesting data in Ukraine now on anti-corruption work. Go research, figure it out. This is just a wonderful opportunity to look and drill into each one of these issues that we've heard our experts talk about um, and contribute to the knowledge base that we have about anti-corruption measures. So once again, thank you to our staff. We can't do this without you. Uh, putting on something like this is logistically difficult. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, wish you all the best and we will see you soon. Please stay tuned for more events and for uh, uh, and we very much look forward to connecting with you in person just as soon as we can. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.